Hello anatomy and physiology students. Uh, today's lecture is going to be over the cardiovascular system and the heart. This is a two-parter. So the heart is actually broken down into two different lectures and this is the part one of the heart. In this one we're going to be talking about the functions, the heart wall, heart valves, sounds, and the excitation of the heart. So a little bit about the heart. It is a double pump. It has four chambers. And the function of the heart is to pump blood throughout the body. Okay, to move that blood throughout the body. Keep that blood moving. If you make a fist, all right, so go ahead and make a fist and take a look at it. And that's roughly the size of your heart. Roughly the same size as a closed fist. So, how much blood does the heart move? How much does it pump? How much does it move throughout the body? And it pumps about 5 liters, 5 to 6 liters, uh, or about 1.3 or to 1.5 gallons each minute. So, about a gallon and a half for an adult, anyway. Um, sometimes when I do uh, kids outreach programs, I'll take some empty milk gallon milk jugs and <clears throat> fill one up completely, fill one up about halfway, and put some red food coloring in it, set it out, and that's a good visual for how much blood does a heart pump each minute, about a gallon and a half in an adult, a bit less than children. Okay, how many times does it beat? How many times does it pump? How many times does it beat? And it does it about a hundred thousand times a day. Alright, so some pretty cool facts there. Alright, so the picture at the top right is a picture of a human heart that is undergoing a transplant. So, um, someone had donated their heart and um, it's going to, it was going into a recipient who was going to enjoy their longer life because of that. Now, the bottom picture <clears throat> is a dissected out heart. And what I want you to notice, see the scalpel and the scalpel is kind of pulling up on a structure. That structure is a heart covering. And that is the serous membrane that surrounds the heart. We've talked about that a little bit, and it's called the pericardium. Cardio, think of heart. So, para, surrounding, pericardium. Now, the functions of the pericardium. Now, there are three functions of the pericardium that I want you to know. Number one, it protects and anchors the heart. Okay, so what does that mean by anchoring the heart? Well, it's attached to the heart, and it is also attached to the surrounding tissue. So it anchors the heart within the media, mediastinum. <clears throat> Number two, it prevents overfilling of the heart with blood. Okay, so it attempts to prevent that overfilling with blood. Now, number three. So a third function of the pericardium <clears throat> is that it allows the heart to work in a friction-free environment. So a friction-free environment. Now, I'm going to try to talk relatively slow, probably slower than you're used to, because you don't get to see me writing on the board. Um, and what I do want you to do is to take notes while I'm talking. I know you can't see me and I'm sorry, but remember you need to be taking notes. Okay, so number three was allows the heart to work in relatively friction-free environment. This is the pericardium. It is a serous membrane, so it is producing serous fluid. Think of serous fluid as that is a slimy fluid. And the heart 
A lot of times when we look at pictures like I have here on this PowerPoint, it looks like a static structure. But, you know, if it is <clears throat> in a living person, it's not a static structure. And it actually will will expand to take on blood, and then it contracts to squeeze out that blood. So it's constantly changing its shape and moving within the mediastinum, within the area where it's located in the cavity. And so if we think about it, it's constantly moving or brushing up against the lungs, right? It's tucked into the lungs there. And that serous fluid that's produced by the pericardium allows for that friction-free movement. Sometimes due to infection or sickness, <clears throat> the pericardium tends, can, can get infected um, or um, inflamed. When it does that, it's not going to produce the serous fluid that it would normally. So if we wipe off that serous fluid, it's not, now it's not in a friction-free environment. And now almost every time your heart beats, which is a lot, right, it hurts. And we call that pericarditis. They say it's pretty painful. Right. Now a little bit about the heart wall. I like this picture because it actually shows the different layers of that heart wall. We're going to be working our way from the outside in. So right over here, we see somebody with gloves on. They're holding out this membrane here, and that is the epicardium. Okay, it is the ep epicardium, and it's actually a part of the pericardium. <clears throat> the epicardium is the portion of the pericardium that is uh, attached to the heart. It makes up the most superficial layer of the heart. Okay, working our way in, we're going to come to the myocardium. Anytime you see MYO as a prefix, that's going to tell you muscle. So myocardium is the muscle layer, okay? It's the muscle layer that's forming the bulk of the heart wall. So right in here where my cursor is, all of that is the myocardium, <clears throat> made up of muscle fibers. There are two networks within the myocardium. They are the atrial and ventricular. <clears throat> These particular muscle fibers have gap junctions between them. So they are very close. They have gap junctions. And the muscle action potential will actually go from one, set, one fiber to the next via the gap junctions and spread throughout that myocardium. <clears throat> now, the endocardium. So the endo is the innermost layer, endocardium, and you can see it pulled back a little bit here. And the endocardium is a sheet of white endothelial cells. Remember, if they're epithelial cells that are found inside the body, we call those endothelial cells. And this sheet of white endothelial cells is resting on thin connective tissue. Now, why, are, why am I even talking about this? Why am I bringing up the endocardium? It's because if we follow that endocardium, this layer that, that think of it like this layer that coats the inside of the heart. If we look at the blood vessels that are attached to the heart, we're going to also see the, the same structure. So the blood vessels that are attached to the heart also have this same structure. We don't call it an endocardium, but it is made up of the same thing. Why is it important? Is because if we think about the blood moving, 
the blood, let's say we're, we're jumping as the blood is returning to the heart. The blood is returning to the heart. The vessels are delivering them. And the blood is flowing from the vessels into the heart. And then from the heart into the vessels. This endocardium allows for a continuous flow. Okay, so it allows for this continuous flow, kind of like <clears throat> if you can imagine, you know, like in your house, let's say you have tile in the kitchen and you have carpet in the living room and if you're walking from the living room into the kitchen, okay, then there's definitely going to be a difference there. But let's say if you have tile in the living room and tile in the kitchen, right? It's just one continuous floor. So any kind of oh, my watch, any kind of um, speed bump along the way when we're talking about blood is not a good thing. So anytime we're going to increase, increase the friction on that blood, increases our chance of that blood forming small clots. And that's not what we want. So this smooth transition, the endocardium allows for a smooth transition of that blood from the vessels into the heart and then from the heart into the vessels. All right, the two circulations. There are two circulations in the body, and they are the systemic and pulmonary. Now, for lab, you had to learn the flow of blood through the heart. We're going to continue that for lecture. So don't forget everything that you learned about the flow of blood through the heart, because it's going to matter here in lecture as well as we talk about the... Um, physiology of the heart. Now, so first of all, the atria. So we have a heart, four chambers, it's a double pump, and we have two atria. Atria is the plural. Now, atria are the receiving chambers. Okay, so when we're talking about the movement of blood, blood flowing through the heart, they are the receiving chambers. The ventricles, they are the discharging chambers. Now the arteries. So the arteries, now a lot of times, especially in lab, especially when you're working with some, with the models, and the models are lovely, have these lovely colors. The arteries, um, really easy to pick up arteries and veins, right, because they've colored them um, red and blue. Now, arteries, how I want you to remember them is by the flow of blood. So arteries, arteries conduct blood away from the heart. Okay, veins, veins conduct blood towards the heart. Now, if you remember that arteries are on models, that arteries are always red, veins are always blue, about 95% of the time, you'll get that right. There is, however, one place, sort of, that you're really going to get messed up on that. Okay, do we know where? If we only remember that arteries are red and veins are blue, we're going to get messed up in one place. What is it? The pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. That's right. So good job if you got that right. Okay, a little bit 
it on the, the heart valves. Now I know you guys already studied these in, la in lab, so I won't spend tons of time on this. But there are four heart valves. There are two atrioventricle valves. And there are two semilunar valves. So this is another thing I don't want you to forget. All right, I don't want you to forget the AV valves and I don't want you to forget the semilunar valves. So if we're looking at the heart, the right side of the heart has one atrioventricle valve and one semilunar valve. And the same thing for the left side of the heart. It's gonna have one of each. Which kind of leads us into the next slide, which are heart, heart sounds. So now we're going to talk about heart sounds. So when we listen to the heart with our ear, right, you can put your ear up to somebody's chest and listen to their heart, or with a stethoscope, like right? stethoscope like you guys did in lab, hopefully, maybe, maybe this semester, I think you did. Here's the thing, we don't hear the heart contracting, right? We don't we don't hear the heart pumping, but we'd hear something, right? We hear heart sounds. So it's not muscles contracting, and it's not the blood moving that we hear. What we hear are the valves closing. So in a typical heartbeat, there are two sound two major sounds, okay? And we call that the first sound and the second sound. So what you're hearing in a heartbeat is this thing that sounds like a lub dub. So lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. And the first sound is the lub, L-U-B. The second sound is the dub, D-U-B. Okay, the first sound, and I have it here on this picture here too. The first sound, the lub, is when the atrioventricle valves close. Okay, they're snapping shut. And that's what you hear, you hear a lub. The dub is when the semilunar valves close. Now, both in the, in the first heart sound, the lub, when you're hearing it, as one, but both AV valves are closing. Both AV valves are closing in unison, and you hear lub. Second heart sound is when the semilunar valves close, both of them at the same time, or I should say in unison, and you're hearing the dub. All right, so back over here. Now at the bottom of this slide, I have a link here to a YouTube, and this is going to allow us to hear those, um, those heart sounds. So just a second, let me open that up. And this isn't long. Normal first and second heart sounds. Listen to the following example. Normal first and second sounds can be heard. Each pair of sounds, lub dub, lub dub, will begin with the first sound and end with the second. Listen to these sounds and keep in mind the systolic and diastolic periods in the cardiac cycle. Normally, the first sound is slightly lower in pitch in comparison with the second sound.
There, so we got to hear it, the love and the dub. And remember, it is those vowels that are closing. Now, it is possible to hear all four valves close by li listening at different regions. Okay, and so if you take your stethoscope and put it in different regions, you can actually get really good and be able to, to hear each valve close. I'm not that good, but I do have some friends that are really good at doing that. All right, so the heart is a double pump, and the pumps contract in unison. This is one of the things that I want you to have the understanding of. Now, both atria contract together, then both ventricles contract together. So it's a coordinated effort. So both atria contract in unison, and that happens first. Then both ventricles contract in unison. That's what's supposed to happen. So we have another short video. Let's see if it's going to work. Maybe. And let's get back to the things we love. To commercial. get back to these things, we all need to do our part. All right, so I got it ready to go. Now, what I like about this particular animation is that it shows you. Um, you get a really good graphic of both atria contracting at the same time, or in unison, and then the ventricles contracting. So that's mainly what I want you to pay attention to. Okay, so in a normal heartbeat, this is what's going to happen. The atria are contracting in unison, and in turn, the atria are forcing all of the blood that is in the atria into the ventricles. Then, as the atria relax, the ventricles contract. Okay, and they're going to do that in unison. So that's really what I want you to uh, look at and pay attention to. So here we go. Animation illustrates a single cardiac cycle, starting with the right side of the heart. In reality, of course, the two sides of the heart work together at the same time. But it is easier to understand if we look at them separately, because each side of the heart has a different function. The cardi Okay, that's really all that I needed you to see of that. All right, so you got to see what that looked like when a heart, it's a healthy heart, and you have both atria contract in unison, then both ventricles contract in unison. Why is that so important? That's, that has to happen if we're going to move the blood through the heart, and therefore move the blood throughout our body. Here's the thing, when blood becomes... When blood slows down, when it, when it stops moving for a certain period of time, what we have the chance of is that blood clotting. So blood needs to be constantly moving throughout our body. So if it slows down at all, then we have the chance of it clotting. We don't want that. Now, so I keep saying over and over again, what is important in order to get the blood to move throughout our body, constantly moving. Both atria need to contract in unison, then both ventricles need to contract. Now, if they're not doing that, okay, if they are unsynchronized in any manner, we call that fibrillation, fibrillation. So fibrillation is a rapid, irregular, unsynchronized contraction of muscle fibers in the heart. And I want to show you what that looks like and with this video.
Okay, so you got to see that. I'm going to back it up a little bit. And let's see what we see. All right, this is a graphical representation of what's going on in the heart. And we see some contracting here. So we see some contracting. It's not synchronized. And now it's back to synchronized. Now we have the atria contracting in unison, then the ventricles contracting in unison. And now it's able to move that blood through, through the heart. The heart was in fibrillation, and now it is beating in unison. So those of you who have taken a, like a CPR class, <clears throat> and you've talked about um, AEDs, and these are defibrillators. So these are defibrillators. So if the heart is in fibrillation, Okay, rapid, irregular, unsynchronized contraction of muscle fibers, right, in the heart, then <clears throat> what that will do is defibrillate it. So what it's going to do is going to give it an electrical shock, and all of those muscle fibers are going to contra contract at one time. Then what do we hope for? We hope that it now becomes synchronized. All right, so a few things about uh, naming. So there, we have some names for contracting and relaxing. When the heart is in the contraction phase, we call that systole. When the heart is relaxing, we call it diastole. So systole and diastole. Next thing we're going to talk about is the innervation of the heart. You've already learned what innervation means. That means with nerves. So we're talking about the nerves. The heart is stimulated by nerves extrinsically and also intrinsically it is self-excitable. So first we're going to talk about extrinsic innervation. <clears throat> You're going to see these words pop up again in anatomy and physiology. These words extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic means it's coming from someplace else. Intrinsic means it's all inclusive into that particular system or structure. So coming from the outside, coming from the inside. Okay, extrinsic means coming from the outside. Intrinsic means it's coming from the inside. <clears throat> okay, e extrinsic innervation. If you take a look at the picture right, up, right over here, it's showing some nerves leading from the brainstem to the heart. Now that is our extra, extrinsic innervation. So it's a nerve running from the brainstem to the heart. The nerve is the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S, the vagus nerve. Now, <clears throat> when, the, when an impulse is being sent to the heart, um, what can happen is that it can make that heart beat faster. So extrinsic innervation is actually accomplished by autonomic nervous system. You've heard that before, autonomic. And remember when we talked about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve stimulation? That's what's going on here. So extrinsic innervation of the heart is accomplished by the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nerves, and the parasympathetic nerves. So if an impulse is being sent along the 
sympathetic nerves down to the heart, it's going to get that heart to increase its heart rate. That makes sense, knowing what you know about the sympathetic response. And so when would that happen? Give me an example of when that sympathetic nerve stimulation would would have an impact on the heart and make that heart beat faster. Okay, you were probably thinking of those E situations, um, like we talked about in class, maybe giving a speech or right before an exam, right? Your heart starts beating even faster, and that's because of the sympathetic nerve stimulation. You could be even thinking, remember, this can be, this can be physical or it could be something you're thinking about that can make your heart start to increase its speed. That's sympathetic nerve stimulation. Now, we also have parasympathetic nerve stimula stimulation. So once that thread is over, impulse will be sent along parasympathetic and parasympathetic will bring that heart rate back to normal. <coughs> I'm so sorry about the coughing, guys. All right, so we know it has sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve stimulation. Now, when someone receives a heart transplant, they do a really good job, and it takes a long time to connect all of those blood vessels back, back together. And, of course, when we're doing a heart transplant, you've got to cut all the nerves as well. Well, it does take so long to connect the blood vessels and make sure all of that is correct that a lot of times those nerves, and usually they because they can't be, those are not reconnected. Okay? So the autonomic nervous system is not reconnected basically. What does that mean for our heart? Does that mean our heart stops can't beat anymore? No, that our heart doesn't even need this autonomic nerve stimulation in order to beat. Our heart is pretty incredible. Our heart has a way where it will beat on its own. And we call that intrinsic conduction. So the heart has its own system that establishes the heartbeat. So this does mean if the heart did not have any nerves connected to it, it would still beat. <clears throat> so during embryonic development, about 1% of cardiac muscle fibers become what we call self-excitable. And then these cells are going to set the rhythm for the heart's contraction. This one, these one percent of cardiac muscle fibers that became self-excitable, we call these pacemaker cells. Now, why, what do you mean by self-excitable? That means that the plasma membranes of these muscle fibers can initiate an action potential they will automatically depolarize. Sometimes we say they have unstable resting membrane potentials. We call these pacemaker potentials. Now, there's not just one cell that does this. There's a cluster of cells that are all built this way. They're all little bitty cluster and we call those nodes. So a cluster of pacemaker cells, we call those nodes. And that cluster, all those cells in there, all depolarize. They, they have this, this ability to depolarize on their own. So without nerve stimulation, they're all going to depolarize at the same time. So these are the pacemaker cells. So if we can visualize this, we have this cluster of cells that are automatically depolarizing. When a muscle fiber depolarizes, it gets that muscle fiber to do something. What is it? It's to contract. That's right. 
So when a muscle fiber depolarizes, that muscle fiber will in turn contract. Now, cardiac muscle fibers are connected to each other via gap junctions. So if the neighboring cell is depolarizing, it's going to get that cell to depolarize and on down the line. So it becomes a spreading event. So as soon as that cell depolarizes, it contracts. And there are various nodes within the heart. So if you take a look at the cursor, there's a node right up in here. It's called the sinoatrial node. Sometimes we just call it SA for sinoatrial. It's a sinoatrial node. And that is the one, all those little cells in there are going to depolarize all at once and then it's gonna start spreading throughout the atria. So there is a predictable path of this excitation and that's the next thing that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so the sequence of excitation in the heart. This is a process and this describes this predictable path by which the pacemaker cells send out action potential, potentials and excite neighboring cells. This excitation is going to lead to a muscle contraction. So this is the, this is the process by which that happens and I have those numbered. And as we go through these, I'm going to point to you out, point out to you on a picture as to what's going on. So number one, the sinoatrial node, SA node, generates impulses about 70 times, 75 times a minute. So 75 times a minute, it, all of those cells, look at the cursor, all of those cells are going to depolarize. And that will in turn depolarize the neighboring cells. So we have a so we have a spreading event that occurs. And if you look at the black arrows, it spreads through both atria. Okay? So it starts here, spreads through both atria. And in turn, what do you know that it's going to cause those atrial cells to do? To contract. All right. There's another node, and it's called the atrioventricular node. It's located here, and what happens is that it's going to delay the impulse. It delays the impulse a tenth of a second. Then that impulse, if you look at my cursor, it's going to get directed to kind of the mid portion of the heart. So the impulse is going to get directed to the interventricular septum, That impulse is going to get directed towards that interventricular septum where we find what are called the atrioventricular bundles. So this is the bundle right here. Okay, so here's the impulse. If we're following this impulse of through the heart from the atrioventricular node to the bundle here, then what's going to happen is it's going to split split into what we call the bundle branches. So we're on to number four. The AV bundle then splits into two pathways in the interventricular septum, what we call the bundle branches. And it's going, so we have impulses traveling along both of these routes and that will take it down to the apex of the heart. Now, as this impulse travels along these bundle branches, it's going to get the myocardium to contract. So we have the impulse traveling along the bundle branches down to the apex of the heart. And then at the same time, this side and this side, they're going to start spreading out. So it spreads out along what we call Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers are going to carry that impulse throughout the rest of the ventricles. 
So in turn, it goes down to the apex, then spreads throughout the ventricles and gets those ventricles to contract. So if we're following this excitation of the heart and we know that what follows excitation of the cells is contraction, we're starting back here at the sinoatrial node. It's spreading throughout the atria. The atria will contract. The blood in the atria gets forced down into the ventricles. By that time, the impulse has been directed to the bundle, then to the bundle branches, down to the apex of the heart, throughout the Purkinje fibers, and then the ventricles are going to contract, both in unison. All right, when the ventricles contract, it squeezes out the blood, and then they start to relax. By the time they're starting to relax, the sinoatrial node has already been sending out another impulse because this is going to happen 75 times a minute. So we want, this is the excitation of the heart. And notice there is no other nerves serving the heart there. So this is an all-inclusive, intrinsic mechanism by which the heart contracts and will continue to contract in that unison. Remember, I keep saying it, and why is it so important? Because if it, it has to contract in that manner in order to move the blood through the heart. If the blood stays stagnant for any period of time, it can increase the chance of it clotting. And if it's not moving blood, it's not moving the blood throughout the body, the cardiovascular system, our circulatory system. <clears throat> so just like you saw in the picture with fibrillation, right? We had random contractions going on, right? So what happens if we have a, what happens? Just looking at the picture. If we have the right atria contract and then maybe the and then the right ventricle, and at the same time, the right atria is contracting. We're not going to be moving blood the way we should. Now, one thing you did get to see in the picture was where they put the little paddles down, and um, I said, you know, maybe you've taken a CPR class, and you've, you've got to um, practice with AEDs. What, that is, what they did in the video, and what you would do for, with an AED, is deliver a shock, an electrical impulse to the heart. Now, why is that a big deal? What happens when we deliver an electrical impulse to an excitable cell? Well, if it's a muscle cell, it's going to get that muscle to contract. So imagine if I had those paddles or an AED machine and I were to deliver an electrical shock to that heart. What's that heart going to do? What's the whole thing going to do? The myocardium, all those cells, they're all going to contract at one time. So the whole thing contracts because of that. Okay, then we let off. Then what do we wait for? Right? We wait for the heart. We want the heart to start beating again. But here's the thing. What are we waiting for specifically? What are we hoping for? Is that the sinoatrial node now depolarizes, sends out that impulse in the predictable path through the atria, getting the atria to contract. Down to the bundle, then to the bundle branches, then to Purkinje, then to get the ventricles to contract. We want this to happen in this order. We want the atria contracting, moving the blood into the ventricles. Then we want the ventricles contracting and moving the blood out of the heart and into the vessels. And that's how we continue that circulation. All right, so that's the end of this first part of the cardiovascular system um, lecture. And look forward to part two. Thanks for hanging in there with me, guys.